All right, so we're going to venture into the world of photoelectron spectroscopy. But first, just a reminder um, that the shell model of the atom came from a lot of work with ionization energies. And so here we see a graph of the first ionization energies for the first 20 elements on the periodic table. And remember, ionization energy is defined as how much energy is required to remove the electron from an element that's in its gaseous state. And so you notice, okay, hydrogen takes about this many kilojoules per mole to remove the one electron. Helium takes much more. Why? Well, because to remove this one electron from hydrogen, we're fighting one proton and the Coulombic force of attraction between it. For helium, we're removing one electron, but now we're fighting two protons that are in the nucleus of the helium atom. And so with lithium being next, three protons, and we got to take out one electron, we would think it would be like way up here, but it's not. The actual ionization energy for lithium is way down here. Why? Well, it had to be because of the Coulombic forces of attraction, Coulomb's law, the charges of the proton and the electron are the same, but the distance must have increased. So the electron that we're taking out of the helium atom must be way further away from the nucleus than the electron we took out of the helium atom. So there must be another shell. And then you can see you know it increases we'll talk about the little dips here at another time but you can see it kind of trends upwards and we have another peak here with neon noble gas and then all of a sudden we crash down to sodium so we're starting to see that there are these shells in an atom energy levels and you can kind of start to figure out how many electrons are on each energy level because of where the crash occurs etc if you look at data in a chart form here, you can see the first column are the first ionization energies, like that was on that graph, but then we have second, third, fourth, etc. So if you look at magnesium, one of the concepts is like, okay, the first ionization energy to remove one electron from a magnesium atom, it's going to take 735 kilojoules. To remove the second one, it says 1,445, but you have to add those two ionization energies together because you do have to remove the first one and the second one. So it would take approximately 2,180 kilojoules. I believe that's what those two numbers added together are. Then you see these numbers in red. Okay, and what the numbers in red reflect are you can remove the valence electrons, the outermost electrons, with relative ease, and then all of a sudden there's a huge spike in the ionization energies because you've gone into the core. So like a silicon atom has four valence electrons. And so you remove the first electron, not too bad. The second one, not too bad. Third one, sure, it's, it's more, but not too bad. Fourth one, not too bad. And then wham, we have a huge drop when we're removing the fifth electron. That's because, knowing silicon's electron configuration, we have removed two electrons from the 3p sublevel, two electrons from the 3s sublevel. That fifth electron would be in the 2p sublevel. So these ionization energies, again, did a nice job explaining our shell model. But then things got better and we have photoelectron spectroscopy. So a beam of atoms is shot into a device and photons of energy are shot at the atomic beam. Electrons come out and they eventually make their way to the detector. And so what's going on here is when we're doing ionization energies, we can shoot in ultraviolet visible or ultraviolet light and that light with energy h nu frequency is shot into the atom and can knock a valence electron out and so we can figure out the ionization energy because we know the energy that went in and we could subtract the kinetic energy of the electron flying out and so we would know then the ionization energy well if we use some stronger 
light ray light rays x-rays and we shoot them in with energy h nu it gets into the core and we can knock that electron out okay but the same concept we can figure out how much energy it takes to get the core electrons out by taking the x-ray energy minus the kinetic energy of that electron being shot out and so what we end up getting are these photoelectron spectra and these are simulated here um, if you've seen a real one there's a lot of background noise and they're hard to read but typically if AP is going to show us a photoelectron spectra then it's going to be cleaned up it might look like this something different there won't be a ton of background noise okay and even this looks a little crazy because we have hydrogen helium lithium beryllium and boron all on one spectra here okay um, the two things we want to look at when we're looking at a PES is the si the height of the peak the size of the peak and then the energy of where the peak is and so on the y-axis we typically have some kind of relative number of electrons and on the x-axis we have some kind of representation of energy this these happen to be megajoules per mole and there are some large gaps with our energies so perhaps you recognize this nice little squiggly line on the axis that means there's a big break in the energy values so hopefully if they're nice they'll put the energy values by the peaks or they'll make it pretty easy to read you just have to be careful because some photoelectron spectra have the zero axis point for the energy some have zero over here this these spectra have zero over here so you just have to watch where the zero is and I'll explain why here in a second first off just look at hydrogen hydrogen's photoelectron spectra only has one peak and it's 1s1 okay every other elements photoelectron spectra its first peak will be 1s2 from helium all the way so the only spectra that we'll ever see just this little tiny first peak of 1s1 will be hydrogen all right so I'm gonna come down to this spectra and it's there's a little less going on so here I have the spectra for carbon oxygen and neon they're all in the second period okay and so this is the data that comes out so first off again pay attention to the peak heights for carbon all the peak heights are the same that means for each of the peaks there's the same number of electrons and what we're gonna realize here or if you haven't already that each peak represents an energy level more specifically a sub level a sub shell and so for oxygen we see the first two peaks are the same but the third peak is twice as high so that peak represents twice as many electrons for neon the third peak is three times as high so that's three times as many electrons and so again for every atom helium and beyond the first peak is the 1s2 peak that's the first sublevel the first shell there's two electrons in there so we can always compare starting from that 1s2 peak that 1s peak should always be at the highest energy point so again if this axis of energy was flipped then 1s's would be on the right and we may see those in other examples but not here so the first thing to notice the carbon 1s peak is at 28.6 energies megajoules per mole oxygen 52.6 neon 84 why are those 1s peaks at higher energy levels again Coulomb's law okay when we these electrons in carbon are attracted with a nucleus that has six electrons in it the oxygen electrons in the 1s subshell are attracted to the nucleus that has eight protons in it and neon these electrons are attracted to the nucleus that has 10 protons so it would take more energy to get those electrons out of the atom than 
for carbon, which is only fighting the six. And we'll talk more about effective nuclear charge and you know how much of the nucleus is actually felt by those atoms. But again, these 1s electrons are closest to the nucleus. They're in the core. So then we see the 2s2 peaks. Okay, and the same thing. It takes a lot less energy to remove these electrons because they're on a whole other energy level away from the nucleus. But you can see carbons is the least then oxygen, then neon for the same reason, because of that nuclear charge, more protons. And then now you can see, same with the 2p, we have a, a, another peak close, so we can see that they're both on the same energy level, and then for carbon it's populated the same, so it's 2p2, oxygen is 2p4 because the peak is twice as high, and for neon 2p6 because it's three times as high. All right. If you want some more fun or to explore a few more of these photoelectron spectra, you can go to this lovely place. I can bring this down. This is the website cbc.arizona.edu. And so you can click on up through element 21 and see the different spectra. So there's hydrogen. And there we see the tiny little peak. Here we see the zero is on the left this time, so the energy is increasing to the right. And so I can look at the, elect the spectra for an individual, or I can put a dual mode up so I can compare. So I'll put hydrogen on the left, and then I'll put helium on the right. And so you can see whatever energy units this is that we have. Hold on. These are the same as the other spectrum, megajoules per mole. But I can see hydrogen with its 1s1 peak, and then helium with its 1s2. Um, I can compare hydrogen to lithium. Okay, so here again, the first peak at the highest energy is the 1s2 peak. And then we can see 2s1. Beryllium. Okay, the first peak, even it's now split because we don't have it long enough and there's that much of a big energy difference the first peak at 11.5 is 1s2 and then we have 2s2 for beryllium boron first peak at highest energy is 1s2 then we have 2s2 and we have 2p1 carbon 1s2 2s2 2p2 okay and so on and so forth um, let me go to calcium over here and scandium. The reason scandium is here, I think, is kind of important, then I'll let you be. But okay, calcium, again, 390, that's 1s2. Then we have at 42.7, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2 is at 4.65, 3p6 is at 2.9, 4s2 is at 0.59. Now scandium, we can see a little phenomenon here. Again, just like calcium, 1s2 is way up here. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then look at this little mess. All right, I've got 0.63 and 0.77. There's a very small difference between the 4s and 3d sublevels. And so we know scandium has two electrons in this sublevel, that's the 4s2, and then we have one electron right here, that's the 3d, 3d1. So you can see scandium, it's much easier, well not much, it's easier to remove the two 4s electrons than the 3d. And so when scandium becomes an ion, it's most likely going to be plus two because we can remove the 4s electrons, and this happens for a lot of our transition metals. But it will also probably be pretty easy to be a plus three ion because you could remove those first or the those three electrons with relatively the same amount of energy. Okay, but that does show again with a lot of our transition metals, if they are plus two ions, it's because they're losing the the s electrons before the d electrons. So a lot of cool stuff with photoelectron spectra. Again, this just kind of scratched the surface. Hope this helps you get a little more comfortable with them. And then um, 
you can see all the wonderful things that it can do. But again, it really proves the solutions to those wave functions with calculus from Schrodinger. And it gives us a good feeling knowing that this was more than just a mathematic theory. It really is how our atom is made. All right. See you later.